Hello, hello. Oh. Hi, Amy. Hi, Camillo. Do we have a cat who's doing like co-star? Or is that a cardboard? Oh, it's a real cat. <laughs> that cat was so, I could go get mine. I have six. And fortunately, none of them are volunteering to pop in here at this point in time. But welcome to Camillo and his cat. What's your cat's name? Oh, you're muted. Can you unmute yourself? Sure. Can you hear there me? There we go. Loud and clear. <laughs> Loud and clear. Oh, sorry about that. So we have Camillo and his sidekick. <laughs> and Josh. Welcome, guys. This is going to be great. Oh, yeah. uh, I'm so glad that you were paired together for, for my segment. Um, two really incredibly rich essays academic, something really to uh, really to examine, take apart, talk about. And I'm glad that you're paired together because this is going to be great. Um, all right. So first, uh, Josh, why don't you go ahead? We're going to introduce, you guys can introduce yourselves. Uh, Josh, you go first. What are you doing? Give us some background, <laughs> et cetera. Sure. Uh, so my name is Josh Herring. Uh, I, I, I wear a lot of hats, so I'll just kind of run through a few of those. I am currently in my last week of being a Dean of Classical Education for Thales Academy. I am defending my dissertation uh, five days from now. I'm defending on next Wednesday. Wow. And uh, so if that, assuming that goes well, I get a title change, but then I'll also be starting a new position as a professor of classical education for Thales College. Uh, so I'm very excited about that. Uh, I was really excited to uh, find out about this issue of an unexpected journal because uh, I have a deep love for Arthurian literature and legend, and I did the Arthuriana class at Faulkner a couple, I think that was three summers ago. Uh, Dr. Lockard and Dr. Fullman led that class, and um, I thought at the time I wanted to write a dissertation on Arthuriana and then decided I did not want to write that, but I uh, was really excited to find a place to uh, pour some of that love for the Arthurian story into it. I've taught uh, Lamort, I've taught Roger Green's version of uh, the, the Knights of the Round Table. Uh, so I'm a longtime fan and I'm really excited uh, to get to talk about that with you guys. Um, the essay I put together also brings in Edmund Spencer and Fairy Queen a bit more than Mallory. Uh, and I'm sure we'll get to some of that as we go. Uh, but uh, that's me. I'm also a debate coach and a podcaster. My show is called The Optimistic Curmudgeon. Uh, if anybody wants, anybody listening wants to follow the show, you can find that on YouTube. I'll uh, I'll put the the uh, link in there in the comment in the chat box in YouTube in a second. But yeah, uh, that's me, Camilla. Fantastic, fantastic. Look forward to talking about it. Uh, all right, Camilla. Yeah, You're Josh, up. it's good to, good to see you again. We've been in several classes together. This works out great. It's and amazing. remember, you guys can talk back and forth between each other as well during this. Please feel free. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, that, I, but uh, we were in those classes together years ago. I mean, I haven't oh. seen you in so long. Uh, but I'm uh, I'm currently an instructor of English at Fort Hayes State University in Northwest Kansas. Uh, starting in the fall, I will be I'm uh, being promoted to assistant professor of English. I just defended my dissertation <laughs> in December of 2021, and that was one of the criteria for the promotion. So, uh, so yeah, I, I can't believe you're defending in five days as well. I that takes me back to when I was in that position. Um, you'll you'll do great, I'm sure. I think, my gosh, actually, I had an interest in uh, in uh, the matter of Britain and uh, for a long time, and I actually thought about doing my a dissertation on something related to that as well. Uh, I ended up going in a different direction too with Russell Kirk's uh, fiction. Um, and I just, I mentioned Kirk a little bit in my paper as a sort of framing device, but my paper is, uh, is about, um, it focuses more on uh, Alfred Tennyson's version of the, of the tales and the idols of the king. And I, it's called uh, Sanctuary and Refuge in the Idols, and um, it was actually prompted by a call for papers by a, an academic journal that was looking for articles related to those topics like refugees uh, uh, and things like that. And uh, I thought, you know, why don't I put something together on Tennyson, who I always wanted to write something about. And I, I did that. This was years ago. The uh, journal was that slow in getting back to me about their response. <laughs> 
Uh, they finally did it and said, hey, we, we didn't get enough submissions. We canceled it. And, and right at that moment, I saw something on Facebook about an unexpected journal putting together a, an, an issue related to Arthur. And I had taken classes with Zach and uh, a lot of other folks associated with the journal, too. So it, it's always been on my radar. I just never had a chance to uh, submit something to it. So I was very excited to do that here and, and uh, very honored to be, uh, to be included among writers and fantastic year of Josh thank you well it worked out really it worked out really well and for those of you out there uh, he mentions um, Zach Zach was the former mm -hmm. editor-in-chief of an unexpected journal and he passed this honor on to the board members so so he could pursue other things in life he's still there as the red phone call that I had to make several times since I had to do this one without a lot of uh, tech knowledge. So Zach was always there to bail me out, but you guys know Zach and uh, he is, he is still a part of us just that he's not here live today. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we all have a great association and great friendship with Zach. So, all right. Well, you know what? I, Part of what excites me about both of your papers that you submitted was that you brought in authors to examine uh, Tennyson and Fairy Queen, Spencer's Fairy Queen. And um, again, like I was talking to Junius, we need to bring these back off the dusty bookshelf and get into them, read them, study them, have classes on them. And I, um, I think uh, first I'll go to I'll go to you, Josh, because when I was uh, reviewing all of these and in, in, uh, editing them, um, I I will readily admit I have not read all of the Fairy Queen. I have copies of it, but I think that's probably common, more common than any of us want to admit. We want to say that we've read the Fairy Queen. Oh yes, Spencer, love him, but we haven't. So just to introduce us to your piece, Josh, could you uh, talk a little bit about the, the letter to Raleigh that Spencer wrote and then uh, Images of Life that C.S. Lewis wrote that mm -hmm. contradicts what Spencer wrote? Could you just kind of guide us into an introduction for that? Sure, it's a great question, and uh, I, I was there in that same spot of having like wanting to be able to say I'd read Spencer. Uh, the first year I taught high school English, there was a uh, line about we had to teach something from the Fairy Queen, and then there was just that that you either love it or you hate it. <clears throat> word in parentheses, excerpts, completely up to instructor's discretion. So I used my discretion to skip it entirely because I had no <laughs> idea who Red Cross Knight was. I didn't know what Una was. I I didn't know any of it. Um, probably this story starts, I think, four years ago now. I was at, uh, Camilla, I think you were there. At the, were you at the Kirk Center for that class with Faulkner four years ago? Am I right? Yeah. Uh, so Jason Jules, our program head, and he did a, he got a grant to set up an intensive class at uh, the Russell Kirk Center in Macosta. And uh, Camilla and I were both there. It was the first year they'd had that class. And uh, I sat down at dinner one night next to a guy named Dr. Ben Lockard. Yeah, I might be dinging. Am I dinging? If so, I want to close that. Okay, uh, setting that down next to at, at dinner to uh, uh, with uh, Dr. Ben Lockard, and we were talking, and I mentioned the fact that I always wanted to read The Fairy Queen. Little did I know that Dr. Lockard is a Spencerian. That was his initial academic love, and he was like, well, in that case, we should do a tutorial on it. And <laughs> <laughs> so I put the paperwork together and the following semester we read the fairy queen together and we spent a whole uh, semester reading it because it is, it is dense. Um, actually, hang on one second. I've got, I love it when we pull references off of our shelves. That's awesome. So this literally is the, if you can just see how thick this thing is, like this is the uh, reigning academic edition of the fairy queen that he had me work from. And so the Fairy Queen is, is a very brief intro for uh, listeners and viewers who haven't read it. Um, 
it is a it's an allegorical poem. Lewis is very clear that he thinks it's not really an epic poem. It doesn't really fit the genre of epic poetry, but it's an allegorical poem set in a not terribly well-defined fairyland. We'll come back to that in a second. It exists in six books with a coda, and there is a raging debate in Spencer's scholarship about whether or not it's complete or incomplete, because in Spencer's original plan, it was going to be 12 books. <laughs> And he died before after before writing book seven. So um, anyway, where this got really interesting, when, when, by the time the end of the semester came around, I had to come up with a paper topic. Um, I got really intrigued because um, Spencer, while he's writing, I think it's either book two or book three, uh, he wrote this letter to Sir Walter Raleigh, where he outlines what he's attempting to do. And as I'm sure you both know, whenever you get an author who writes a complex text actually tell you what the point is, that's really interesting. That, that, gives, that solves some of our many hermeneutical problems. It's like, great, the author told me what it's all about. <laughs> well, except that in the letter to Raleigh, um, Spencer explains that what he's really trying to do is provide these images of different virtues. And he goes through and explains which character is supposed to line up with which virtue. And then he gets to Arthur, and Arthur is supposed to be the Aristotelian virtue of magnificence. And this is the problem for Lewis, because Lewis then comes back, and Lewis, um, I learned this later as I was working on the dissertation, Lewis wrote a ton about Spencer. Uh, he wrote a chapter in uh, the Oxford History of the English Language about Spencer's Fairy Queen. It's in the last chapter of the Allegory of Love. And then, but his actual class lectures were collected together from the notes taken by one of his students and then published as Images of Life. So that's a posthumous publication that Lewis did not himself do or authorize, but they're really good. Uh, and they're like word for word what Lewis, most likely what Lewis said. Oh, and wow. Okay. In the Images for Life is what I ended up working with for this article. Um, Lewis goes through and says the big problem here is if you go back to Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, magnificence is the quality of being really rich and spending your money like you're really rich, <laughs> which is great. I'm a poor academic. I have been the recipient of much magnificence from wealthy donors at college and at conferences along the years. It's great. But that's not what Arthur is doing. So part of what my paper is then trying to do is figure out, okay, the author says this, a world-renowned scholar of Spencerian literature says, no, he's not doing this. How do we reconcile that? What exactly is going on? Because Arthur is one of the most consistent characters throughout the Fairy Queen. He shows up in every book. He shows up almost always in Canto 8. And he seems to interact with the key virtue figure in each book. Uh -huh. And so what does he have to do? Why does Spencer lean so heavily on him? All of that is kind of what I'm trying to get at. I can say the answers if you want, but I don't want to give it all away if we're not if we're trying to use this as a teaser. Uh, but that's that. That's kind of what I was trying to get at, and it was really fun to wade through. How do we still respect what the author says about his own work, and yet deal with what he actually does, which is different than what he says he's doing? And it was what a it was challenging. Really that's challenging contradiction to try to reconcile. That makes my head spin. Um, that's a that's a complicated thought. But the your your paper goes into so many. It's footnoted, cited. It's really wonderful. So you lay out your paper in a, a way that I can understand what is going on. So um, I appreciate what you've, what you've done here. And pairing Lewis and Spencer is just kind of fun. Yeah, I read the article last night. And uh, great article, Josh. And... Uh just put me in the mood to crack open the, the Fairy Queen again. It's yeah, I know. Now I want to go back to it. I have copies of the Fairy Queen. I see them up on my shelf. Oh, yeah. They're this tall. They're leather bound. They're 200 years old. I don't know how those people oh, read those, but don't read them. They're, it's like one point type. Yeah. Oh. But I started to read them and it's, it's beautiful to read. I just... I need. I think I need your book that you held up and showed us. It it, it helps a lot. Yep, that's it. This yep. is the. Uh, it's just Spencer the Fairy Queen, second edition, edited by A. C. Hamilton, and okay. a string of Japanese scholars are the sub editors, which I find fascinating. Because I would never have expected there to be like this subset of Japanese scholars who just love Spencer, but that's uh, Hiroshi Yamashita, 
Toshiyuka Suzuki and Shohachi Fukuda. Like, Fantastic. It's amazing. Oh, one thing I will say about if uh, if you do want to get into Spencer, just the kind of like your first experience reading Shakespeare, mm-hmm. you just have to trust that you can figure out the slightly archaic language. It's not yeah. as big a barrier as it initially appears. But if you can just get into if you can just get into it and force yourself to read it, like suddenly it will click and it starts to make sense. Yeah. But yeah. that I think that's the hardest part of starting reading Spencer. Yeah. Um, the other thing I will say is I in uh, I think this is an allegory of love. Lewis made the fascinating claim that reading Spencer is actually good for our mental health. Really? <laughs> I'm gonna have to find that. I I have his I have that book. I'm gonna have to pull it off my shelf and read that specifically. No, I, I can send you the page number. It's it's for, I, I have to go find the footnote, but it's I can send you the specific page number. But he literally he thinks that Spencer is so good at describing positive images of life, and he just restores your faith in the joy and wonder and beauty of the world. Mm-hmm. That if you're feeling kind of depressed, Lewis would not tell you to go to a therapist. He wouldn't tell you to go pull some medicine off the shelf. You say, well, if you're feeling blue, you should go read some Edmund Spencer. Okay. Well, and so our assignment to all of our watchers and listeners to this uh, episode, your assignment this week is to get yourself a copy of Spencer, the fairy yeah. queen, and start to pick through it. It's honestly, it's it's good to do that. And once you do get the rhythm for that kind of archaic language, it does click. Mm-hmm. And then when you go back and read something that's been written modern day, it's hollow Mm -hmm. and boring and empty and gray and flat. So, uh, yeah. And if uh, the fairy queen intimidates you because it is thick, you know, Spencer was an excellent poet. Everything that he wrote is uh, worth reading. He wrote an excellent sonnet cycle, Amoretti. Mm-hmm. Uh, he wrote the uh, his uh, wedding uh, songs and things like that. I mean, just pick up a collection of his work and see how you like that. And that should put you in the mood to uh, explore his Arthur. Excellent. Excellent. All right, Camilla, I want to go into uh, a question about, I thought it was so interesting. I, I never thought about doing a haven, the, the safety for the lost, the, it's a refuge um, that you wrote about your paper. So you talk about the universal desire to find a haven, particularly an inner haven in right actions. Can you share a few thoughts about what it is in the story of Arthur that evokes this promise? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, like I said, the idea for the article came about because I saw a call for papers and They wanted uh, papers related to havens, sanctuaries, refuges, and the people who are associated with them. So like refugees and and asylum seekers and everything like that. And as part of my research for my dissertation into Dr. Kirk's fiction, you know, I obviously learned a lot about his uh, life and so on. Both of you probably know this, but uh, Kirk was very generous in welcoming uh, people to his own home, to Piety Hill. Uh, he had single uh, unwed mothers, uh, you know, uh, refugees and, and people who just had nowhere else to go uh, that he took in and, and provided for on his own uh, on his own dime. And I was thinking about that in relation to the call to papers that I saw. And, uh, and I was uh, and uh, this was for a journal that specializes in, in early uh, modern in the early modern period. And I was thinking about the Arthurian legends and. Trying to put it all together, the uh, version of those legends that I know best is, is from Tennyson. So that was the one that interested me from the start. I mean, I just love the idols of the king. I think they're so underrated. <laughs> kind of like uh, Josh mentioned how there's some question about how much of an epic Spencer intended in his work. And I think uh, the same uh, criticism has been lodged against Tennyson. Uh, the idols are kind of uh, separate poems that are put together they tell a, a story but they're not all like it's not um you know there's not like a story that unfolds throughout they all focus on different uh, characters and so on so there's a question about how how unified the whole thing is but um i i think that um 
and just like uh, Spencer in the Fairy Queen, you know, Tennyson was looking at his society and and all the issues that English people were dealing. He spent his whole life planning to write this poem. I mean, thinking about writing about King Arthur. And when he finally sat down to do it, he's in his 40s or 50s. This is he he, he was already well established. He was a poet laureate of, uh, of uh, Victorian England. And he's thinking about his society, which is which is suddenly dealing with its own uh, immigration and refugee uh, questions, uh, not just the Irish uh, and, and Scots and things like that, but Jews from Europe, you know, fleeing repression there. What do we do with them? All of these questions are being debated in Parliament and, and by Tennyson's uh, fellow authors. So in the... Uh, in the Idols of the King, I think he's trying to put together the statement about what Victorian England is supposed to be, and and he sees a model for that in Camelot and in, in Arthur's Kingdom, and and uh, so the response to refugees and things like that isn't a huge part of the Idols, but I think there's enough enough incidents there, enough uh, emphasis there uh, to write. The, uh, it's an admittedly short paper, but I think you know I think the point is definitely that. Um, Tennyson would agree with Kirk and, and many other traditional conservatives that uh, when it comes to matters like that, to questions about refugees and people who need help, it's better to trust in um, the ver individual virtue of, of our great men and women and, and our men and women who want to be great than it is to create these massive uh, governmental bureaucracies to handle mm -hmm. these problems because those bureaucracies are just going to mess everything up as, uh, as we see. Uh, so in the idols, you see, uh, like the point I make is that uh, Arthur, I mean, he assumes personal responsibility for people who come to him asking for help. And this is, of course, going back to the Middle Ages and the sanctuary traditions that developed there, or even back to ancient Greece, if you go back far enough. Um, but the point is, again, that uh, individual virtue, like uh, our leaders, uh, the wealthy, the, the powerful, the educated, they are the ones who have the responsibility to uh, care for those who are less fortunate. And um, that putting your faith in government to solve problems like that is, is just going to make things worse. And, and so so I think what, that, what specifically in idols can you bring to connect it with that idea of the haven? Well, uh, Camelot itself is... Uh, and this is uh, this is uh, I mean this is a central part of the Arthurian legends, uh, but Camelot itself is a haven, right? So uh, in the early book of the in the first book of the Idols is about um, Arthur founding his kingdom, and mm -hmm. how does he do that? He first has to clear it of all of these. And if you read Mallory, Mallory is kind of the same. Like what exists before Camelot comes into being? It's this wasteland filled with brigands and, in Mallory's case, giants and dragons. Actually, I think Tennyson might might uh, mention them too in passing. But all these horrible creatures and, and men and women that are terrorizing the land. And Arthur uh, comes along, and you know he's got this clear vision, this this, uh, this vision of a Christian kingdom that can bring order to the realm. And so he establishes his kingdom there, and. One of the things I noted in my paper is even, uh, you know, Camelot becomes, for however long it lasts, it's this place where people can get help when they need it. It's also a place that puts people on their best behavior. Uh, even the wicked who go there, uh, they, they tend to avoid causing mischief there. There's just this ennobling idea represented by the city. And I think that's what uh, Tennyson is getting at, too, in his version of the of Camelot is like England can be this place in Europe. It can be a Christian kingdom that imposes order on uncivilized parts of the world, right? This is the height of England's colonial enterprise. And for Tennyson, it's not necessarily such a bad thing because there are people around the world who need to be enlightened, who need to be saved from the forces of disorder and so on. Okay, great. Um, Josh, do you have anything to add to the idea of uh, Haven, anything in um, Fairy Queen that you can connect with this? Um, I was trying to think about that when I saw that Camilla and I were uh, paired together in this. I don't know that there's anything as specific as Camelot in Fairy Queen because part of what Spencer does, and this this is one of the places where people who want to say that it's less complete than it than it could be will point to. 
um, Arthur is on, Arthur is still a prince in the Fairy Queen, and he is mm -hmm. on a quest to find Gloriana, who is uh, the, the literal Fairy Queen, and she is uh, the allegorical representation of Queen Elizabeth I. Mm -hmm. And in, the, in as much as Spencer completed, Arthur does not complete his quest. So the, the Fairy Queen is all before he would have then gone back to England and would have established his kingdom. Mm -hmm. um, the closest that we get, I don't even, I, it, this at least fits thematic is what Camilla was saying. There's not a, there's not a political place of like safety. Mm -hmm. And, and I mean, in, in Fairy Queen, there are always monsters around and there are always strong people, warriors who can fight off monsters. Um, but it is the presence of virtue that enables the knight to triumph over the monster. So if, if there's a, if there's some hope for the refugee, it's that the hope for the refugee is that is not a, is not removing the danger, but it is the fact that the presence of righteousness is as common as the presence of wickedness. So that whenever you have a monster, like I'm thinking of, um, I think I'm remembering the de details right. It's been over a year since I've read this. So mm -hmm. any, anyone who's listening, I, if I mix up names, I apologize. I think there's one scene where Arthur, there's a monster or Goglio who is a uh, symbol of pride. Uh, I think he's a giant and Arthur comes along and he has just exemplified some form of humility. So Arthur like beats the giant and trips him and the giant falls. And it's a picture of the humility triumphing over pride. And wow. in that sense, uh, character, virtue, righteousness, justice, all of that is its own way of creating uh, a response to wickedness in the world. But it doesn't function the same way as the a stable city and a, a temporary haven kind of like Camelot does. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. that, yeah, very interesting. And, and I wonder too, Josh, if you think that maybe the backgrounds of the respective poets, I mean, Tennyson is this lauded, wealthy poet laureate of a stable <clears throat> English kingdom and as you know, Spencer was bitter from the way that he'd been treated. He had all these ideals that didn't come into play. I wonder if that's reflective too. And I, it's it's certainly possible. It also the surrounding historical context is probably yeah. relevant. That I mean, Spencer is I mean the immediate the preceding twenty years before Spencer is writing about Elizabeth are all this chaotic. Yeah, right. You don't really know if it's Bloody Mary or if it's yeah. uh, James or it's Edward or who's going to be king and and it and as opposed to uh, if I'm getting this, if I remember right, I mean Tennyson's writing under Victoria, and it's very yeah. stable. And like, yeah. the British Empire is it keeps expanding, and and it has yeah. that effect that you're describing. Yeah, right. Great. Wonderful. All right, we have a couple minutes left. Um, Danny, oh. that's my cat. Uh, oh, wandered over to sitting on the table. She can't. You can't see her, but she's here. We've got. We've all got cats. That's fantastic. They all want to YouTube <laughs> together. Um, so, any projects coming up that you're working on, either of you, both of you? Um, well, I'll, I'll mention two. I'm. Uh, I'm hoping to publish the dissertation uh, after a successful defense, and I'm also working on uh, finishing a tenth grade. Uh, history textbook that covers uh, Roman history through medieval Europe. So uh, I would love to finish that this summer, and then we'll be pu I'll be publishing that through Thales Press. So that will eventually be available uh, through the Thales Press Amazon page. If anybody wants to check that out. Excellent, excellent. What was the subject of your dissertation, Josh? Did you mention it? Uh, Lewis and gender. So this is. Uh, uh, yeah. Oh right. I, I can say a lot about, about it. it. I know we came up on right. time. Yeah. <laughs> right. um, and Camilla, do you have any month? Yes, I, I'm presenting next month at the online uh, summer Ooh. seminar that is being presented by Mithlor. I'm talking about uh, Charles Williams, Russell Kirk, and Stephen King, their respective Ooh. depictions of hell, which actually there's a lot of overlap despite each of these mm -hmm. figures representing a different faith tradition. They characterize it in surprisingly similar terms. So this sounds like a like a Peter Kreeft book that you know he comes up with the, the three debating from totally different angles yeah. about the same thing. That'll be an interesting book. Sure. Which, Fantastic. Which, yeah. uh, which Russell Kirk book did you or books did you work with for that? Well, for that one, I'm looking at I'm actually using Kirk's eschatology, which you know a lot about. 
as a framework for analyzing Williams's and Keynes because Ooh. Kirk is always good at explaining exactly what he's trying to do, you know, in his stories. And Williams is not like Williams is, can be really confusing. <laughs> you guys both know. Uh, King is not as confusing, but I think that Kirk gives us some uh, uh, nice tools for analyzing mm. timeless moments, you know, how they work and so on. Fantastic. All right, guys. Well, this has been an absolute delight to hear you both talk about your papers. I'm thrilled that uh, your academic work has been added to the journal and uh, it makes for a great read and reread. It's kind of like reading Dante. I got to read it once, skim it, <laughs> and then go back in and take in the footnotes and go off on my rabbit trails, reading all the footnotes and referring to, because I know Zach brings up Kirk all the time. <laughs> and I really need to, I need to read more about Russell or read more. Oh, read more there we go. So, uh, look at that. Oh, the third cat in the triad. Looks like a wise, wise cat. All right. Well, thanks guys for participating. Thank oh, yeah. been... thanks, Annie. Yeah. Appreciate all your work editing. You make those uh, things. Great. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> thanks. And good luck with all your uh, upcoming uh, dissertations and uh, pre presentations. Good luck, Josh. All yeah. right, thank you, thank you, sir, and uh, same to you. All, All right, right. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Thanks, guys.